if you click your video and unmute yourself, you can uh, intervene. I don't know if Amanda Brewster, Frank, whether you want to say anything to begin with, or just if somebody else wants to. Hey, John, let, let me make a heads up here. There are several people who are chatting saying they're trying to send to you the survey, uh, but it does not command to send. It may be something at your end, but three people have said they can't submit the answers to that online to you. Uh-huh. Well, and I see I, one person said that I just went up to 70. That was stupid of me since I'm above that age. Uh, so just put yourself in that upper category. We will extend that indefinitely in terms of the age. Uh, somebody else, you have to answer all three questions before the submit button becomes available. Is what Joel is saying. So that's I, if you're not aware of that chat function at the bottom, that would allow you to to both comment and see what other people are saying. Okay, Angela, I see a hand up. Go ahead. Yes, I'd like to answer all the questions, but the first question, I can't say I was active in the anti-war movement because I was in 1968, I was only 11 years old. So I only became anti-war uh, much later when I worked for the U.S. government at the U.S. at the U.S. Embassy in Laos and at the U.S. Consulate Ho Chi Minh City. Uh huh. What years were they? What years? Uh, were I was they? in Laos, 2000, 2000 to two thousand two in Laos, and then again in two thousand eleven and twelve, and Ho Chi Minh <laughs> City. 2007 to 2011. Okay, well, we probably crossed paths at some point. <laughs> That's right. Or at least we're in the same I've city. More than once. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, at any rate, that's fascinating. And John, I mean, as you come on, John, this is say that about yourself, do introduce yourself so that people know who you are. Yeah, who was speaking? John, it's Frank. I'd be interested in hearing some more about how your experience in Laos in particular, I guess, led you to become anti-war. Okay, let me bring that to the later on, because that's a post, very post-war situation she's talking about. Um, so let's stay on this time period. Dennis has his Sorry. finger up, so why don't you unmute yourself, Dennis? Can you... Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Sure enough. Um, I was on the call last week and uh, found it fascinating. I, I think this is a very commendable project because, um, you know, we, we're, we're all or most of us are Americans and uh, have been brought up with the idea that history is bunk. And uh, so, May 1970, which was the most incredible campus eruption the country has ever seen, has totally disappeared down the memory hole. Um, a lot of young people today have never heard of Kent State. I was interviewed by some nice folks at a thing called Interference Archive in New York who, who did a, uh, made a podcast out of it, which I've got to listen to one of these days. But what the when I went and talked to them, they were all under 30. And most of them knew what Kent State was, and none of them had even heard of Jackson State. Right. Now, for our generation, that's heresy. Right. I mean, you come out of those events and stayed political. Somebody says Kent State, you always say, and Jackson State. I mean, it's... Right. it's you get it wrong, but you say it. What? <laughs> you get it wrong, but you say it. Right. The Jackson so, State people are very determined. Well, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's not the same. It isn't. And I, I accept yeah. that. Actually, people should read um, uh, Nancy Bristow's new book right. on Jackson State, which is excellent. Um, just published. I, I think she, she was probably planning to do a, uh, a book tour and stuff like that, <laughs> you know, right. times to the 50th anniversary. Right. However, um, I think the thing that I missed last week, and I would hope that other of the old heads who were involved at the time here would talk about it. I mean, 
that was an insanely exciting, vibrant time. I mean, you didn't know from one day to the next, you know, were you going to a demonstration? What were you doing? What was the next, uh, what was the next particular task? And a great deal of it, as was emphasized, I think, by Amanda last time, was very local, was very particular. There was not national coordination. Uh, there was a newsletter came out of Boston, which mostly circulated, I think, in, in New England and uh, maybe, you know, New York, New Jersey. <clears throat> but most people didn't find out about it from that. They found out about it from long distance phone calls, from local underground papers, which came out weekly and picked up stuff from Liberation News Service. It was, um, and, you know, I mean, my campus, let's see, we took over a computer and held it for ransom for a hundred thousand campus? What campus was that then? That, that was NYU. I was at the Uptown campus, but we took both campuses struck while we were still in New Haven. You know, we were, all the campus left was in New Haven for the thing. And we, you know, the, the demo was called and we voted to, uh, you know, strike. So we went back to campus to call the strike to find out that the campus liberals, you know, the kids who were headed for law school and maybe a career in the local Democratic Party had already called the strike. <laughs> and that was hugely, I mean, I don't know everywhere, you know, New York's a political venue, but in a lot of places, well before Kent State and in a lot of places, even before people got the national call, people were out. Yeah. And so... That was, um, you know, uh, let's see, with, in the, within the first week, we took over a computer and held it for a ransom for one of the Panther 21. Um, we took over the NYU print shop. We took part in demonstrations downtown um, uh, for, uh, uh, on Wall Street. And we're there when uh, people were attacked. We organized high school students um, in the Bronx, those of us who were at the Uptown campus, to help put out underground newspapers um, and strike themselves. And uh, uh, we started setting up institutions on campus that we thought would carry us through the summer because it was becoming pretty obvious that uh, the approach of the administration, as it was at many schools, were going to be Oh, yes, you wonderful young people, you know, you, you're you the conscience of the nation. What you're doing is really right, and we think you should do it, and therefore, we're canceling all classes. Um, everybody passes. You should go back to your communities and organize there, and incidentally, you've got three days to get out of the dorms. <laughs> you know? So we set up things like freedom schools and uh, so on that could take students who wanted to stay, high school students from the community as part of our open admissions campaign. And we were just constantly doing stuff day by day. I mean, one of the reasons there were only 100,000 people or whatever it was at that big demonstration in Washington, you know, none of the campuses that I, I know of in the New York area sent at anybody because we were too busy doing local stuff where we were. And I mean, it's that sense, I, I hope, that we can try to reclaim and convey that, yeah. you know, everything was up for grabs and uh, we were grabbing. I, I think that's really important to understand. Yeah. Are you we in New it. York now, Dennis? I am. You're in New York. Okay, somebody started to say something. Yeah, Mary, you got to unmute yourself. Uh, excuse me, my hand's been up. Okay, you're, you're on, go ahead. Me Mary? or the... Yeah. I, I, I was thinking after last week's session um, of another influence that hasn't been mentioned, but I, I know I'm not the only one who belonged to the National Students Association. Uh, made it really, uh, one of the Jump Johnson movement came out of that, Allard Lowenstein from New York. Um, but I remember between 66 and 67, David Harris gave a speech about the war and the resolution to end the war lost by one vote and it was like 371 to 370. The next year when we came back 
it was totally reversed. And I remember um, people like Ed Schwartz going around saying, what happened to all of you this year? Because the vote's totally different. Well, what happened was everybody started getting involved and getting arrested and, you know, being involved in these crazy antics, you know, the police locking up the whole movement, which they did in Pittsburgh in one night. They had three separate arrests and had everybody in jail when Dave Dellinger came. But um, it's, it's an interesting thing because of the bad publicity it got about the CIA connections. I still know people, I'm in Baltimore, and there's a lot of us who were in NSA during those years. And Where were I'm you in school? Influence that had on other people yeah. or how important it was nationwide, because obviously most of us were doing stuff locally too. But I just uh, remember that was, I think, a pretty big influence for a lot of folks. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was a real forum. Um, where are you right now? Where I'm are you? I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. Still in Baltimore. I'm in Baltimore. Oh, where yeah, were you in I, school? Were you in, in school? Uh, I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So okay. I spent the 60s in uh, Pittsburgh, and I've been around, but I've been here for 35 years and mostly working with unions right now. Ah, okay. Somebody else. Hi, uh, uh, this is Stephen Spitz. I wanted to, first of all, tell uh, everybody that all of those people that you just mentioned, I knew. Uh, in 1967, I was at the NSA convention uh, in College Park, Maryland, and Ed Schwartz was running against Ruthie Bauman, who was from the University of Michigan, where I was going to school. Uh, David Harris came to the University of Michigan in about 67, told his, uh, around that time, he had been convicted, but hadn't yet been jailed. Uh, I was very impressed by him, but I was going to law school, so I did not do what he did. Uh, however, in 1970, which we're celebrating the, uh, the student strike. I was at the University of Chicago Law School, mm -hmm. first year student. And when the, uh, I think it was when Kent State happened or the invasion, or I'm not exactly sure of the sequence at this point. It's, it's only been 50 years. But at any rate, uh, I remember I was living in the dormitory attached to the law school. And one of the guys told me, you never get five students to vote to go on strike. Well, he was wrong. We had a meeting the next morning of the entire law school voted virtually unanimous to go on strike and send a delegation to the demonstration that was happening after that in Washington. And a delegation of us went across the campus where we came to where the philosophy graduate students and the like were debating whether or not they should go on strike. And when they heard that the fascists in law school had already voted on strike, they said what, they voted immediately to go on strike. That's at the University of Chicago. Okay. And Stephen, you're just on the phone, right? Yes, you're I'm not... just on the phone. I'm sorry, okay. I am- Oh, uh, no, that's fine. I, I just was trying to figure out how to find you and I couldn't find you. And where are you living right now? I am living in Falls Church, Virginia, for D.C. right now. Uh -huh. okay. And I, I also wanted to tell you, John, and, and the rest of you put that together. That was an excellent program uh, that you put on. I was particularly uh, impressed by the specificity of the eyewitnesses at Kent State and Jackson State and, and out in uh, California. I mean, that was, that was really impressive. And then, of course, hearing Peter Yarrow sing, Times They Are Changing. I mean, what's not to love about that? Can you, can you please say your name again? It's Stephen Smith, S-P-I-T-Z. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this, is Michael, this is Michael Green. Michael, uh, let, me, let me just say two mechanical things, because I'm just discovering this. If you look on the right side of your screen, there's a blue, an arrow, a blue arrow. If you click on that, you can see people who are in the, who came in later. Also, if you're using the chat, you have two options. You can chat to everybody, or you can scroll down the list of people on the call and chat with a particular individual. So go ahead and introduce yourself again. I'm sorry, I just wouldn't. Okay, this, this is Mike Green. 
Um, I, I, was, um, I was at City College. I was a regular faculty member at that time. And 1970 turned out to be the second year in a row that we did not finish the spring semester. Uh, the uh, struggle in 1969 was not so much around the war as it was uh, for open admissions and for uh, bringing minority students into uh, City University, which was mostly all white, or nearly so. Um, and uh, again, this, this, the demonstration was of a magnitude to shut down the school. I don't know whether anybody sent a delegation from the college or not. Um, I went with a different group, which I think, uh, John, you may have been a member of it. Uh, this uh, uh, Committee of Return Volunteers. Committee of Return Volunteers, and, yeah, um, I, was yeah, the I head think of I it remember you from there. Yeah. But in any case, um, the uh, college was shut down for a second year in a row, and uh, it joined uh, with all of the other uh, schools that uh, were shut down. Yeah, Michael wrote a very interesting note about this, and it's it goes off a bit from the direction of this, but the effect mm -hmm. on the whole question of openness of the city university system uh, was so into, so mixed up in the question of the war that it had some longer term effect on the local institution. Hello. Uh, Which is still going on. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Yeah. Who's next? Uh, this is Steve Jones. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Steve. Hey, hey, where, are you? where are you, I'm, Steve? You've got in trees Cincinnati. in the back. I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I, I uh, listened to the last uh, program last week. Brewster had asked me to see if I wanted to get on, and I, I said yes. I was a student at Kent State from 1960 uh, uh, to 72. Um, I was on the main campus only the last year and a half full-time because I had to work. I worked in a factory and uh, and a golf course. And at that time I paid my way. And so I was, I was not on campus that day. However, I was involved in a number of groups and I was on two panels with local politicians, including one of the Tafts who was trying to run. And I took the, my, my deal on the uh, panels was anti-war. And I was always happy that I felt, probably didn't, but I felt I embarrassed the Dickens out of them by the time we were done. Uh, and on uh, May 4th, 1970, I was in the car at Worcester College to be on another panel. And of course, we got the call, we heard it on a radio on the way there. So that worked out, but I still have an um, awful lot of friends and the issue that I have, because uh, I was not there, but the mother of one of my classmates was there, and that evening on May 4, she brought her shawl, her sweater, four or five handkerchiefs full of blood where she had, she's a nurse, and she had tried to stop the bleeding. And because of that, I had several friends say, are you going to go this year to the commemoration? I emotionally, I couldn't handle it. So I was not planning on going. Uh, I wasn't there, but I was half a degree away. And so after that, then I, uh, when I did move to the campus fully, I did, I produced some TV shows, a couple of TV shows and did the, um, the news on TV a couple of times. And uh, on May 4th, 1972, uh, I was a student of uh, Charlie Brills, who was one of the, the head of the, the photography department and uh, CBS there and he's and we we that year we planned i did a number of things planning of course on a on the campus we planned uh i don't remember how many minutes four minutes of silence or whatever i don't remember and cbs came and interviewed me and uh right. we were involved all the way yes great um natasha you've got your hand up i think yeah, I've had it up for close to twenty minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I just, okay. I just know, I just noticed the symbol. <laughs> it's there's, um, there's some. Um, I'm also one of those people that's using their phone. So okay. I see that I showed up twice. Uh, and where are you the, calling? The, where I'm are you calling, calling from? Portland, from? Oregon. Okay. And um, I um, was a freshman in college, Beloit College in Wisconsin, at the time of. Kent and Jackson State, and 
also the Chicano Moratorium that spring. Well, I was in high school in six, spring of 69. But anyway, um, we were on a trimester system. So our spring summer term had just started in April. So we basically decided we could not go on strike because we would blow the whole trimester. And so um, what we did was we had different campus actions. Now, our campus was small, but it was a very liberal campus. I'd say 75% at least of the campus were anti-war. Um, not everybody was active, but that was the general sense um, of the campus. So one of the things we did was um, we wanted to do outreach to the community. <clears throat> so we, um, there was the Beloit Corporation. Beloit was a small industrial town. It's basically um, on the uh, southern Wisconsin. If you go any further south, you would be in Illinois. Okay, so that gives you some idea. Two hours from Chicago and then one hour from Madison, Wisconsin. <clears throat> so we, um, we went to the, um, the Beloit Corporation and handed out leaflets. Now, here's an important thing. Uh, the guys decided that... Um, since they had long hair or afros, that uh, it, they would be harassed. So they said, well, you girls, that's what the, we were called then, or chicks, uh, you should put on dresses and uh, look nice, and then you can hand this stuff out. <clears throat> and the budding feminist that I was said, that's exploitative, whereupon I was shouted down by a guy that said, you're exploited. No, you're not. We're exploited. Uh, and so I kind of fumed, but I went along anyway because uh, I decided I wanted to do something concrete. And so that touches on sexism within the anti-war movement and in particular the mostly white student left, which is another topic, but I think it needs to be mentioned uh, at this point because it was a real thing. The other thing, I ended up being roped into um, um, <clears throat> running off the mimeograph machine, okay? There was no no building of leadership among women. There was just no encouragement of us to be um, other than handing out leaflets and um, cranking out the mimeograph machine, even though we were perfectly capable of doing much more. So I want to say that we were supposed to be in a supportive role. And uh, <clears throat> that definitely was a consciousness raising experience for me. Within six months, I was attending uh, women's meetings, and I was in Boston for um, a, a term off. So fall of 70, I was plunging into, starting to plunge into the women's movement, and that was one of the catalysts for it. But but basically, I didn't hear about Jackson State for, for years to afterwards, and I was a history major. I, I look at the world through an historical perspective, and I was certainly aware of racism. So um, it, it's just the way the mainstream media kind of hushed it up. And I also didn't learn about the Chicano moratorium of the high school students in East Los Angeles marching out uh, till um, much later. There was a wonderful PBS series called Chicano. Just one word came out in the probably early 90s, as I recall. Anyway, there's one whole episode, you know, a whole hour, just about the Chicano moratorium of the young people in spring of 69 uh, marching out. Um, from their high schools in East Los Angeles, and they got support from some of the college students. I don't know about UCLA, but they got students from students from some of the state universities. So this had more working students, whereas UCLA had more, um, you know, more of an elite um, student body. So that that was extremely important. And again, so we're getting into where were women during all this, and where were the people of color? Okay. So then, for various reasons, I ended up moving to the West Coast going to University of Oregon. And so there was, uh, so I was there in 71. And prior to school starting, I went down to San Francisco for a women's march on the Presidium. So that would have been Labor Day weekend of 1971. And that was very powerful. It was all women. Women were supporting each other. Uh, nobody was arguing over who had the correct line, nothing like that. It was just unity. And we were in unity with the, the women of Vietnam. And so that was a, a, a powerful experience for me. And so I did participate in some larger demonstrations um, in, at the University of Oregon campus, especially when we went downtown. Uh, there was the, the bombing of um, Haiphong Harbor, I believe, in 70, spring of 72. 
and uh, some other anti-war actions. But primarily by that time, I was mostly involved in the women's movement because that uh, spoke to me. That's where I was listened to and encouraged uh, and supported. So it's, it's, it's kind of a mixed history, but it was, it was absolutely uh, a, 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 an event that young people were affected by. Yeah. And have and, you uh, written, I mean, this is a question to generally to everybody, and you noticed it on the, on the poll, whether uh, anybody has written a mini memoir or an account of those years and uh, made an effort to get it into the local history museum or university that you went to or uh, there are a number of national collections of anti-war stuff. Um, what, I, what I did do, what John and others, was for my master's, which I completed later, I went after years of community organizing and union organizing and teaching and different things, I went back to get my master's and I did my thesis on the uh, social movements of the 60s and 70s. Uh, and since there were a lot, I focused on the anti-war movement the Black Movement and the Women's Liberation Movement. So, you, so that hasn't that been was, published, but it, yeah. it got in, it got out into at least my um, cohort in grad school. Yeah, yeah. That's. I think that I don't want to take time on it now, but I think the issue of getting people's personal recollections written down while we're still capable of writing them down is. Um, I want to ask. Uh, we were thinking of doing breaking into these small groups and you know there are 43 people um, so I'd probably break it into uh, five groups um, and then just for people to spend 10 minutes together and then come back um, one of the things when we come back I'm interested in is having Bob Levering talk about the two films that he's involved with that, that would be relevant to everybody on this call. But is that okay? Do you want to try this, uh, how this breakout room system works? We've had people who've done it who's found it very useful. And all I have to do is, um, there we go. Maybe I'll do six rooms. And you will be in a room and uh, we'll give you 10 minutes and then we'll call you back. And, <clears throat> and you should basically organize yourselves. So uh, inter I'd say one way of doing it is just everybody should introduce themselves and then uh, we'll, it's hard to do that with 42 people, but among six or seven, you can do it. And I may move some people around so that there's somebody from VPCC in every group, but we'll see if I can figure out how to do that. So enjoy. College about 25 miles 
outside of New York City, um, a lot was happening and um, it was easy to integrate myself either into New York City demonstrations, uh, campus demonstrations, Drew University was across the street and highly principled religious folks who were anti-war and kind of, I tried to work with them and say, hey, come and help me organize on campus. Seventy, I was in D.C., Baltimore, and New York. This is Stephen Spitz, and I currently live in Falls Church, Virginia. In 1970, I was in Chicago. Uh, this is Andy Bloomberg. I live in Cleveland, Ohio, currently. And um, actually, look what's in the background, a beautiful Vietnam poster uh, in our upstairs room. I, in May of 70, was in um, Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, active in the People's Peace Treaty and People Against Racism. This is Andy Berman. I live now in Minneapolis, Minnesota. At the time of Kent State and Jackson State, I was Um, I, was, I was drawn to this. And maybe I'll be quiet and let somebody else speak. Well, it sounds kind of quiet. So uh, I'm Lance and uh, Lance Woodruff. Uh, I was never in an anti war demonstration that. I was a journalist in Vietnam, uh, recruited by church groups and part of a program in Vietnam, 66 to 68. Uh, I remember distinctly watching it on TV with my dad, who said, pay attention to this, it's going to be important to you one day. Um, I, some years later, I joined the U.S. government as a foreign service officer. I uh, worked in different places, um, Middle East, found my way to Laos, and again, in Laos and later on in Vietnam, working in both of those countries after the war. I evolved into a pacifist. Uh, since I retired from the State Department, I um, one of the one of my activities now is uh, I'm an advocate with a local uh, group of Quakers uh, and active in the Friends Committee for National Legislation on trying to reduce the Pentagon's budget and get more funds uh, for domestic purposes and for peace building and diplomacy. But I spent seven years
anybody who hasn't spoken want to say, oh, is that, John, are we back? No, 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 I'm just drift. Oh. I can move around between <laughs> the rooms, so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but it'll be about an, another minute. And yeah. we'll, we'll Jeff, would you like to say something? I think you haven't contributed. Oh. So we're going to do about two minutes. Oops. Um, what did he throw out? It's nothing. Okay. okay. I hope that was, I dipped into each of the rooms, so not surprisingly, people found something to talk about. <laughs> um, I don't know if, if Bill or Bob, if you want to say something about the films. Bob Levering, Bill Prince. Yes, do you wanna... I, yes, I'm here, but I but I wonder. Okay, well, what, there's two films uh, that I'm involved with that uh, I think Bill would be a better person to talk about. The Boys Who Said No, but anyway, The Boys Who Said No is a film that we've been working on for I don't know, is it six years now? Uh, started with the reunion of uh, draft resistors. And it's specifically about draft resistance. I don't know if Bill Prince is on. I'd, I'd rather have him describe. Sure. Sure. So go ahead, Bill. Um, I'll say yes, it started uh, with a reunion of draft resistors here in the Bay Area, uh, including part of it at David Harris's house. Um, and the reunion was filmed, and since that time it's been uh, under production. It's pretty close to finish. It tries to tell the story of draft resistance from the West Coast and also from the East Coast and also within the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And part of the story about SNCC is the way that draft resistors stood on the shoulders of SNCC and took inspiration from the civil rights movement. And we're hoping that we can channel our film when it's done uh, so that uh, people today can take inspiration from the story of the resistance. And uh, www.boyswhosaidno.com. Very good. And Bob, do you want to say about the other film? Sure. Uh, this is, we just started this about a year ago. And our working title is uh, The uh, Movement and the Madman. And we're, uh, we're focused on the year between, of 1969 between Nixon, 
Nixon's inauguration and the moratorium in October and the mobilization in November. And we're, uh, you know, at the present time, we're uh, conducting oral interviews <laughs> because it's pretty impossible to, to do any more, uh, you know, in-person talking head type interviews with people. But, uh, and then we're, we're getting a wide selection of people, you know, including uh, people like Mort Halperin and Roger Nor Morris, who worked on Kissinger's uh, staff, you know, in the White House. Uh, so we've got the, you know, the coordinators of the moratorium, Sam Brown, David Mixner, and David Hawk, um, and then uh, various people who were involved in the mobilization, like Cora Weiss and Dick Fernandez, and uh, as well as a lot of local, uh, you know, people that did local organizing, uh, like Mary Posner, we interviewed her last week. Uh, you know, she was in Muncie, Indiana, you know, on moratorium day in October. But anyway, that's, so we've got a wide variety of people that were uh, involved with historians as well. But we're telling the story of what impact these demonstrations had on Nixon's policy in Vietnam. And very few people that were involved in it, let alone the public at large, realized that our demonstrations actually stopped Nixon from doing a massive escalation of the war, including the potential of nuclear weapons, uh, using nuclear weapons. Um, and that, you know, we, we've got, you know, people within the White House and historians and others, you know, to be able to help us tell that story about what an effect we had and we you know those of us that are involved in you know demonstrating we sometimes don't realize the impact that we have and this is a case where it's actually a very specific impact right then and there uh, oftentimes our our uh, the effect that we have is something that uh you know, it takes years and years to sort of unravel, but this one was, was pretty immediate, even though we didn't know about it. Because the last thing that the people in power will ever acknowledge is that uh, f folks like us have an effect on it. You know, the, the famous line that Nixon used literally about this demonstration where there's a half million plus people within shouting distance of the White House is that he claimed to have watched uh, a football game while this was going on. So this was, of course, demoralizing to a lot of us, but it also wasn't true. I mean, he was actually obsessed with what we were doing. And it, as, as I said, had a big effect. But anyway, that's what our film was about. And we hope to be, uh, you know, complete the production of it uh, this year. And then, uh, you know, have it, you know, maybe in a year's time actually have it in, uh, in some kind of shape that people can see. But anyway, so. And Bob, do you have a website for that? Yes, it's called Movement and it's called www.movementandthemadman.com. And we can, I mean, I, I, I guess Steve Ladd said that he would uh, send some materials uh, that you could send out later, but it's movementandthemadman.com. Okay. And the why madman. Don't, why don't you put that on the chat? chat. Oh, okay. The, the uh, boys who said no is on the chat too. The, while we're talking about videos, the, I managed to miss it, but Terry, do you want to say something about the Jackson State event the other night, Thursday night? Because sure, this is John, we, we didn't have the link, so I didn't send it out to people, but it will go on that information page. I got it last too late last night. And it's certainly worth watching. Go ahead, Terry. Yeah, May 70 was the month of demonstrations, and May 2020 is the month of webinars. So Kent State had one on May 4th, and we had one on May 9th. And Jackson State University also had a very informative and moving one on Thursday night, May 14th. It's about 90 minutes long. It was produced just by themselves as we were. The Kent State one was done professionally. It begins with a 10 year background historically of how white youth and people 
were taunting and victimizing African-American students on what is called Lynch Street, of all names, uh, that runs through the University of Jackson State, which is what was happening on that very night in 1970, when the police came, lied about guns coming at them and people shooting and so forth, and opened fire and killed two students and wounded, I think it was 13 or 14, or might have been 12, I'm not exactly sure. Then four people uh, who were there at that time gave their testimonies of what they experienced, all of them unique and very earnest and, and, and inspiring. And then there was a little bit of time of questions and so forth. So fortunately, we've been working very closely with Jackson State University. Two or three of us were going to be on its campus this very time to be in person for their 50th celebration. And, um, and so we have a nice working relationship. And as I mentioned to our committee, it's almost poetically tragic that the commencement in 1970, which would have also remembered Gibbs and Green, the two who were killed, was canceled because of the uproar and the injustice. And that, that same thing is happening again 50 years later, their commencement, at which time this year they were going to honor them and actually present them with their diplomas because they still have not been able, I mean, they haven't done that officially. So they, have, they hope to do that sometime soon and we can let you know about that. But if you go to Jackson State University website, You're you can see the link. And as, and as John said, he'll be sending it to you as well. All right, I seem to have inadvertently put myself in a different screen. Let me get out of can can everybody still see everybody else? I don't know what's going on at this point. The, the uh No. On the secret we can if we scroll down. Oops. We can if we scroll down. Okay. John? Yeah. You see up in the corner somewhere it should say stop sharing screen. Yes, I didn't mean to share that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Each time we learn a little bit more about this. Um, the, as I say, I will put the link to that uh, on the information page um, that we did after last week's session. And, and the one for Kent State is already there. Um, there is also a film that's been gone through a number of iterations about Kent State that was shown on a 100 PBS stations last week but or two weeks ago, but it was a local option uh, and it was mostly secondary tertiary markets would be, uh, I didn't see any of the big cities on it. So, um, well, I would say we have some more open time now um, Andy, are you still on? Andy Berman? Maybe. Yes, I'm, I'm still here. I, I just okay. All right. I was just thinking that I know Andy did organizing within the military. I don't know if there's anyone else here that's a veteran. Um, that whether and Andy, if you want to say anything about that and how that fits into this. Oh, there you are. Um, and if there's anybody else who, can, who wants to bring in that piece of our common history. Okay, John, but um, you know, uh, forgive me, but I will be mentioning your name in the context since you, you were instrumental in the way things developed. Um, I knew John in the Committee of Return Volunteers, former Peace Council for Volunteers. Um, I'm not sure what year you were the chair, um, but when I, I said I was working for Liberation News Service in, uh, at the time of Kent State and Jackson State, um, but um, at the time with the uh, increasing, um, with the rise of the women's movement, the women at Liberation News Service um, were said to be, well, you're a enough, a nice enough fellow, but our policy here at LNS for the foreseeable future will be only to hire women. So um, my last assignment for LNS was to cover the 
National Convention of the Committee of Returned Volunteers in Chicago. Um, and there I met John. I'm not sure if I knew you before that. And John nominated me to be president of the Committee of Returned Volunteers, co-president with um, another member, Trudy Pax. And so I became president of the Committee of Returned Volunteers. Now the Committee of Returned Volunteers, former Peace Corps Volunteers, was like many organizations, liberal but moving left, moving very strongly to the left, to the point where we felt that the Peace Corps itself was no longer viable given the reality of U.S. imperialism. We were sure coding that until we stopped the war, until we broke the back of U.S. imperialism, um, we had no love for the Peace Corps. And so we dissolved ourselves. And when we dissolved ourselves, everyone looked for something else to do, essentially in the anti-war movement. I had been very much impressed by resistance going on in the army. Um, in, in other branches of the military at that time. And it struck me after going on a demonstration at Fort Dix, New Jersey, where I got tear gas with dozens of other people when we got on base with our anti-war banners, that we needed to be on the side of the GIs. And so I enlisted in the Army. And for three years, I spent um, time in the U.S. Army um, in Germany, in um, several bases in the South, organizing at the coffee shops, um, writing for the underground newspapers, holding demonstrations where we could. Um, my philosophy at that time, kind of towards the latter part of the war, um, was that just keeping a presence of anti-war activity uh, in the military was healthy. And in fact, um, um, I think it was very that the military decided that um, a ground war was no longer winnable um, and they moved to the air war. In any case, um, that's, uh, I did spend three years in the military, um, got out just at the time the Paris Peace Accords were being signed. I was harassed, hassled, threatened, I was moved from one base to another to get away from organizing, but I did survive, and I survived to this day. And, um, I don't know the viability. I think it's very important to understand that soldiers, even those that are volunteering, because they're still all volunteering, are there, they're not the enemy, of course, they need to be uh, integrated into our work wherever it is. And I'll stop. So, uh, thank you. Is there anyone else who came out of the military into the anti-war movement in this uh, call right now. Um, okay, and we have uh, a few more minutes. If out of this, uh, one of the things that's always preoccupied us is how to communicate, translate, share, what we think we learned 50 years ago um, with people today who are involved with similar movements, uh, the obvious ones being the effort to control guns and uh, Black Lives Matter. And um, there's a, a feeling and the environmental movement, I suppose, and there's to just name three, but that somehow there's, while there may be individuals that have kept uh, a hand in and are still involved in some of those things, that it tends to be very distinct and we've never figured out whether there's a, a specific way to share or whether there should be a way to share. But that's, that's one of the, the questions that we often discuss among ourselves in the, in the committee. Um, but so I would throw that out. But if there's anything else that anybody wants to talk about more generally, please raise your hand or wave your hand or just start talking. Um, yeah, Suzanne, go ahead. Um, I wanted to say that I think that 
go back to the to the veterans for a minute. I did some work. I worked with one of with one, the first one of the first black draft resistors, and I was amazed at how courageous he was to determine that he was going to go to jail instead of um, work to to um, be in the military in any kind of form or fashion. And then I met the Vietnam vets against the war and did some work with them. And it, some of the things that most, I wasn't in the military, but some of the things that resonated that I thought were important was how they had been indoctrinated to dehumanize the Vietnamese and it needed anybody in Southeast Asia. Um, and that they were drilled constantly in the racism that was needed for them to completely dehumanize uh, the people they were going to kill, men, women, and children. And so that was just intense. And I know one of the guys one time told me, don't approach me from behind because I might kill you. You know, so the level of violence, the level of discrimination um, that people were indoctrinated to and drilled in, um, made a big impact on me. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I have a comment. If you can, can yeah, you hear Joel, me? Go ahead. Yeah, the uh, uh, environmental movement is Michael, actually quite, sorry, quite relevant because, uh, first of all, the Pentagon uh, is a major source of carbon dioxide itself, but it was also employed to protect uh, the uh, petroleum, the shipping of petroleum. Uh, and uh, U.S. petroleum reserves in, in many countries, so that uh, there is a really uh, important tie between U.S. strategy uh, in, this, in the form of protecting petroleum sources and um, the um, environmental movement. The, it, it gets worse uh, as the Arctic opens up and uh, multiple countries, including Russia, for example, uh, are looking to the Arctic as a source of petroleum. So um, the connection is, is fairly direct, actually. Okay. John, I think Joel Schwartz, uh, Go ahead, Joel, Jack. Schwartz was, Joel Schwartz was trying to speak. Right. That's I thought. So I, I would... I, Go ahead. Yeah, that's me. So I just wanted to sort of second um, what Andrew was talking about. Uh, you know, I, I was also at, the, at a demonstration at Fort Dix like two months after Kent State and Jackson State. And I don't know if that's the one you were talking about, Andrew, but um, it, we were there. It was Armed Forces Day, which we called Armed Forces Day. And um, uh, it, it, was, uh, it, it was, you know, everybody was really nervous and scared. I mean, we were marching on the base. But, but because it was two months after Kent and Jackson, you know, we just had no idea what the reaction was going to be. And at a certain point, uh, a, uh, a, a truckload or two of uh, soldiers got out of the uh, trucks that they were in and started approaching us with uh, guns that had bayonets on them. And, uh, you know, we all were scared shitless and we didn't know what was going to happen, but nobody was going anywhere. Uh, and then as they got closer, uh, we sort of realized that there were no clips in the guns, and so we were a little relieved. Uh, but when they were right up next to us, a guy right in front of me, uh, he was holding his rifle up like this, and he turned his palm around, and on his palm was a peace sign. <laughs> and it was just one of those light bulb moments for me, which, you know, I cry about when I think about it now, you know, mm -hmm. where I just sort of realized, wow, these guys are not our enemies. They're just, they're the same as we are. You know, and, um, you know, I mean, that has stayed with me my whole life, that moment. And uh, so I just wanted to share that. No, hey, that, that, that was Ed, my feeling. Let me, Edwina had her hand up. Uh, so uh, go ahead, Edwina. Edwina, you need to unmute yeah, yourself. Let's see. Okay. Um, You're unmuted. Go ahead. Talk. Oh, okay, great. Um, I guess a couple things. Uh, as far as veterans, um, but you've covered up. You've covered up the camera with your fingers. Whoops! Sorry. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> okay. 
Veterans for Peace is still very active. And in fact, the um, new um, director is an Iraq veteran. And um, when I was up at Creech Air Force Base protesting the drones um, being directed from Creech in Nevada, um, he organized a protest at a local uh, Air Force Base nearby on the basis of um, increasing Air Force use for weapons training in a uh, national area. And so this is becoming, <clears throat> excuse me, more of an issue for leadership and veterans for peace. And of course, the vets, combat vets who are in this area are still very active on issues around war. And so I would uh, encourage people, if you're interested in organizing with VIP, um, there's still a number of people who are active um, on this issue. Um, I would say in terms of um, being involved with uh, younger people or younger organizers is um, if you still have the time and the energy to be involved in organizations, um, to go in with a, um, a, um, a uh, attitude of respect and um, to uh, kind of listen and see uh, what people are doing first before kind of coming in and saying, well, I've been an organizer uh, in the past and here's what I see. Of course, if you're asked, you know, what your past experience is, that's important. But that's what I would say. I, I'm participating with a lot of younger people in immigrants' rights issues, on Palestinian solidarity. I will tell you that um, technologically, obviously they have a lot more on the ball than I do, but they also have a lot of creative ways that I hadn't thought about. And given the COVID uh, environment, um, it's, it's really interesting. The uh, immigrants' rights Puente in Phoenix um, have been calling to let the prisoners out of uh, Arizona jails um, because of you know the laxity or not even the existence of any kind of practicing of self-distancing or um, sanitizers, that kind of thing. And one of the first organizational efforts they did around that was to organize a car caravan to drive by, and it's been three different prisons here in Arizona, to organize people in cars to drive around, to go to those sites and to raise the issue. They've contacted the press. And I thought, how creative, because I think a lot of us are probably feeling like, how can we organize when there's no street? <laughs> and there's no opportunity for that. So that was really exciting and I thought very inventive. So I think, um, you know, listen to younger people and then um, kind of bring your experience when you can. So um, still lots of issues that we still haven't resolved. Many years, right? Thank you. Anybody else? And I want to, I figure another 10 minutes we should. Hey, John? This, yeah, uh, this James, go ahead. Or. I'm sorry, this is Brewster. Uh, in Brewster. our breakout, I'm sorry, you want me to speak? Yeah. Yeah, go in ahead. Our, our breakout session, Amanda, um, who was one of the youngest in our group, <laughs> um, uh, we asked her uh, about, gee, what, how does she, what, what should we be doing or how does she see younger people get, being engaged in these uh, today in, in progressive uh, organizing and politics? And it'd be interesting to hear, Amanda, uh, what you uh, expressed to me in writing. Why don't you share what you said? Amanda's on page two, at least on, on my screen. Oh. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I was uh, messaging with Brewster a little. Uh, he had asked me, um, you know, what we should be doing to get more young people involved in organizing and in uh, social movements and things like that. And um, I was saying that I had actually noticed recently among a lot of people my age, a big uptake, uh, uptick in interest in that kind of thing, sort of around uh, the COVID-19 crisis and seeing um, the way that class issues have been really uh, revealed uh, by the impacts of the virus. Um, you know, it's a really, I think Edwin was talking about, it's a very interesting time to try to organize people uh, when you can't really do any of the things that you would normally do. Um, but I hope that that can sort of continue beyond, uh, you know, outside of a global pandemic that, um, that will continue. And, um, I was also saying that I think that, uh, sharing like your guys' stories about organizing, um, 
against the war is really important um, for young people to hear, um, just to sort of combat um, this feeling of like helplessness that, you know, you see mainstream politics and you see that nothing changes and you see, you know, how much power these corporations have. It's really easy to feel like there's nothing you can do. So I think hearing your guys' stories is really important. Thank you. Thanks. Angela, were you, did you have your hand up? I couldn't, yeah, go ahead. You gotta unmute yourself or I'll do it. Okay, I got it. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to recommend, um, I think that all of the causes that you mentioned that we might intersect with that, that are worth teaming up on are represented by the, the Friends Committee on National Legislation uh, quite friends as in Quakers. I'm, I'm, I'm part of a, I'm a, I'm the non-Quaker in our Quaker group of activists and they, you know, they uh, advocate on all the peace and social justice issues and they put together since Trump was elected 300 teams around the country and they're continuing to grow. Uh, our team was number 82 and there are over 300 teams now. So they're throughout the country and they are, you know, consistently advocating on uh, the uh, getting the defense budget down and getting domestic, the domestic agencies funded and uh, food assistance and all that stuff. Um, so I highly recommend them because they're still working. Uh, and they're working in a, in a big way. And when we go into the Capitol and talk to our Congress people about the necessity for getting the military budget down, you know what they say? They say that the friends are the only ones who are ever advocating that issue and that all they ever see is lobbyists for the military uh, establishment. Uh, and so, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna vote that way. And, uh, but, Occasionally, they'll hear something from from one of our groups that will give them pause. Yeah, Thank half you. of our of VPCC or former AFSC, former American Friends Service Committee <laughs> staff people, and there are a number of others on this call also um, who I recognize: Bev Henkel and John Braxton, and um, you know, they're the the Quaker influence throughout through us, in us personally and in organizational work is profound. Um, James, did you have your hand up? Um, yeah, briefly, I just wanted to uh, follow up on what Joel said. Um, and you know, one of the things I remember during the May Day demonstrations in, in DC um, in 71, where you literally had active duty troops patrolling the streets. Um, it seemed like every Jeep, or pre just about every Jeep that passed by, you know, had four troop, four soldiers in it, and one or more of them was giving us a peace sign or raising a fist um, and greeting to us. You know, so, I mean, there was an awful lot of support for us among the, among the active duty um, military. Yeah, one of the things that we, I mean, there's some good and useful things about the Ken Burns series, but the thing that absolutely drove us crazy was his seeming putting in contradiction veterans and anti-war people. Um, and, you know, the, the relationship, and I think we'll see that surfacing around the VVAW anniversary, the the big march in Washington when when uh, John Kerry gave his testimony and and people threw their medals back. Um, hopefully that will bring back into the into focus the relationship of of veterans and activists and the veterans who became activists. Um, you know, and to some extent, Ken did that because all of his the people he focused on turned against the war by the end of it, and some of them actively, but he still set up this false contradiction between the peace movement and, and veterans. Um, and, uh, you know, Angela uh, is not the only person on the 
call who has a State Department background and interests and, um, you know, the people went through a lot of different experiences um, that have wound up in the, we didn't, haven't touched so much on the question of, of where the, how we manage not to deal with the endless wars um, that now, now afflict us and afflict the rest of the world. And, and in, in my particular interest in terms of Cuba, uh, the fact that part of the, of the lesson for this administration of what you do with COVID is to try and make it harder on people and and it's there's been calls both from the Pope and the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations to that the U.S. should end its sanctions and particularly its unilateral sanctions, but instead uh, we've doubled down. Um, so that's my particular concern on the international side. But I know there are other people again on this call who have different interests. The, internationally and the fact that uh, the problems, that, the things that brought us together 50 years ago are not uh, foreign to today's experience, unfortunately. Any, anyone else? Yeah, Michael. Yeah. Um, ironically, Daniel Ellsberg, who is still around, has done a study of uh, the effects of nuclear weapons if there were a, a war between India and Pakistan. Uh, and they dropped their bombs uh, on each other's cities. Apparently, according to Bill Foster, who was the only um, physicist in Congress, uh, this would produce a nuclear winter, and uh, which would presumably mean the end of civilization at the very least. Uh, so nuclear weapons are still a very major uh, concern, and uh, that has not gone away. All, all of the smaller wars uh, that go on forever and keep killing people um, in the mere in the mere tens of thousands uh, don't end civilization. But uh, we're still on the edge of uh, an extremely uh, dangerous uh, period. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, on our uh, the web or the channel that we have on YouTube, where all the videos are from the the conference in 2015. There's a very nice interview with Dan that he did for the conference we did on the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon March. Carol, you have your hand up, Carol Jensen. I, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I'm, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I'm putting up my face because I'm in my car and anyway, but, um, uh, I wanted to say, and I'm sorry to have come on late. I was an hour off um, I'm on the West Coast. That's no excuse. But, um, but I wanted to say something briefly um, related to the role of faith communities, because I understand that hasn't really been a topic so far. Um, I know um, specifically related to the strike and the events of May 1970, um, that a number of campus ministries, um, uh, Jewish and Christian campus ministries around the country were... Um, were deeply involved in in that. Um, I was at the University of Washington. My um, my Lutheran campus minister was um, a guy named Bill Hershey, who was also the clergy and lady concerned about Vietnam staff person for for our area. Um, and um, a number of us, um, just my own experience, got involved through um, through that and in our campus activities and the demonstrations. But um, but I think even more importantly than um, than the demonstrations was how um, organized ourselves to go out um, and speak in congregations. And this was, um, this was before we did that sort of more massively, like around 72 with the Honeywell project and so on. But in 70, um, um, you know, not many people in mainline churches were, were, were um, certainly protesting the war. And um, a number of students did go out um, uh, I was one of those people, and uh, and I think it it played um, a role at the grassroots level in you know contributing to um, much more education and to, um, to also um, you know gradually turning the tide of public opinion. So I just um, I wanted to raise that, especially since it yeah. Yeah. hasn't been raised before. 
Yeah, no, it's, it certainly uh, was a very important part of, uh, from the very beginning. I mean, uh, how many draft counselors operated out of church basements <laughs> was when nothing else was visible. Um, and, Frank. Yeah, Frank, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on, on that point because I think that in the current moment, one of the things that we can all do individually and we're all connected to lots of networks is what's most, uh, the one thing that we can do, I think, to change the conversation is what we did around the war and that is introduce explicitly moral questions. Uh, we're channeled into talking about economics and politics and what Dr. King was telling us in his breaking the silent speech in 1967 is that we need to introduce values into the conversation. That's what's missing. And the fact that that was present both in Dr. King's speech and before it is what really energized and mobilized and gave us the authority, whether we were civilian or military, to speak about the war. And I think introducing that both in the fighting for the history of the anti-war movement, but all of us, of course, wouldn't be on this call if we weren't still active, need to be very clear that it's the moral voice that we brought to the conversation was what changed the conversation. That's not always in faith-based organizations, by the way. In fact, the immoral voice of faith-based organizations can be a part of the problem, but it doesn't change the fact that that is a critical component that we brought then and that we need to bring into the current conversation. Lee, were you raising your hand? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Just a quick, a quick comment. Um, I teach high school, and one of the things I always think about when dealing with young people is what I'm talking about, where was... A, what was going on in the world at that point for me? So 50 years ago, this happened. So if we're talking to a young person from, some, from 50 years ago, think about what happened in your life 50 years before we're talking the teens, the early 20s, before the anti-war movement. And what were you thinking about? How much were you reflecting on the movement in the teens and the 20s? And I think most of us weren't. And so it's a challenge to us um, folks to figure out I think, how do we not make our movement just ancient history, but also still have it connected. And I also did want to share just real quick that people did, um, I, I was activist in, at UC Berkeley in the late 70s, early 80s, and we definitely learned um, from folks. There was, uh, when people talked about not hearing about Jackson State, whenever we heard about Kent State, we also heard about Jackson State. So that was good. Chicano Moratorium, we heard about that. Uh, Ten-year anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium, we sent folks down and all that. So, so at least in the short term, in some areas, we learned a lot from. from Great. And where are you right now? I, am I mean, other than your background, I don't think you're in this gorgeous place. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's the background is Death Valley. Right. Okay. So we're <laughs> there, but it's the virtual background. Yeah, but where are you right now, physically? Oh. I'm in Davis. I spent most of my life in the Bay Area and a year ago moved up to Davis to okay. get away from the craziness of the San Francisco Bay Area. <laughs> okay. Terry, you've had your hand up. John, I just wanted to follow up with what Carol and Frank were saying about the role of the religious constituency. And though it's not as visible today as we might want to see, but there was one reference to FCNL was really useful. Another one is the Poor People's Campaign and the movement led by Reverend William Barber from North Carolina. I invite people to go to that because it talks about militarism and poverty and racism a la the Martin Luther King Jr. speech of 1967. And that campaign is organizing a nationwide activity to protest perhaps with signs in your yards or maybe with cars at certain places on June 20th of this year. So please see if you can participate in that, and it will also have local clergy. I just was on a 1,000 phone call conference uh, the other night about that, so I encourage you to take a look at that to see what you might be able to do where you're located. Okay. 
the, both Frank, Frank and Terry have one other quick thing. Go ahead. Um, I have a family thing I have to sign off for here in a minute, but partly picking up on what Terry said, and I know there are some people that I know personally who are on the call now who have made contributions, financial contributions to uh, the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. I think we should thank those people, but we should also encourage others to do so that we can keep on doing the kind of webinars and the kind of work and the kind of uh, efforts to lift up our movement uh, for the past and present and future generations. So that's a, a commercial message for my parting words. Send money. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Terry is very glad that you said that. <laughs> well, that's all right. Yeah, just send it right to me. That's fine. <laughs> no, no, that we can't do, Terry. Sorry. But, but we do have a, through our organization, the Fund for Reconciliation and Development, it is a 501c3, and we serve as the fiscal agent for uh, the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. So, and for doing the webinars, uh, it cost us about 3000 bucks because we, with Terry's work and we hired a publicist, which uh, I think brought us in some additional people. Um, and then uh, uh, Zoom itself charges, this, this one is relatively inexpensive, but the webinars, they charge 140 bucks to, to do. Um, so at any rate, there are, costs of doing everything and everybody has multiple places that I'm sure are now asking you for money. But if, if you have the possibility, the, the link is on the information sheet, the, the online link. Um, all right. Well, we'll, I have not looked at the poll at all. We will look at that. And if you have a chance uh, and want to send in an individual note, You've got my email address and I'll share it with the rest of the committee. Um, it's uh, one of the questions is whether we should do uh, webinars regularly and what they might consist of. I mean, I would say that even the thought, Lord knows what's gonna happen to us all in the next six months. But if, if our lives continue to be uh, grounded in the same way, we might want to get together on a monthly basis with this group of people and and see uh, what that might lead to, uh, and we'll we'll put that up as an option and and see if that's of interest to people. Um, but thank you very much. We, you know, we I think we started out with forty two people, and we have thirty seven now. Um, there was one question of, uh, that was interesting and interested in how the Vietnamese handle the anniversaries of the end of the war. And I'm happy to, to talk, to answer his question to any, or, and anyone who wants to stay is welcome to stay, but you can sign out individually and uh, we'll see you again in the future, I hope, because um, uh, this is, I think it's been been useful, and it reminds me of what what that 2015 conference opened up. That there's a lot of of history uh, among the people in this Zoom call, and among the people we know that uh, you know we've we've lost some important people in our movement in the last two years, and none of us are gonna even beyond the COVID question. <laughs> We're not immortal and getting stuff written down and getting archives built um, is tre tremendously important to, and doing events like this. This, I should say this has all been recorded and it will be, we'll put it on the YouTube channel. Um, if that is problematic for anybody, you should should let me know. I don't know if I can delete particular sections. I don't think I can. I'd also be interested in some feedback about how the breakout rooms went, whether that was a useful uh, 
methodology. So at any rate, um, say, I'll say goodbye and, and anybody who wants to stick around for the uh, uh, conversation about, where is that, trying to see who asked that question. But at any rate, um, I'm happy to, to talk. If you, you, Nathan, you did. The, okay, I'm happy to talk about that because uh, I have have a history of going for these every five year um, events in Vietnam. Um, and it's changed, uh, but you don't need to feel at all obligated to stay on to, and I'm not gonna go on forever on it, but um, I, my one moment of uh, footnote of history that I assume is worth saying is that I arrived in Hanoi for the first time on April 30th, 1975 with several other people, AFS, one other AFSC staff person and several people from the Indochina peace campaign. And uh, so I literally, we arrived in Hanoi at the same moment that uh, the US ambassador was leaving Saigon. Um, and so that kind of settled, put that moment in history very strongly in my personal life. And I've been back to every five year anniversary, which the Vietnamese celebrate things on a five year cycle. Um, the, uh, it didn't happen this year, of course. We did have a group that was going to go and go to events in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and it's, we will, we don't know. We've, we're now hoping that that group will go for the 25th anniversary of normalization of relations in late June, July. But though the Vietnamese are doing very well, they've lost, they've had no deaths and only a couple of hundred, uh, people ill. But I don't think that this country and international air travel is going to make that possible. But at some point we will take another group and uh, whether it'll be go on, postpone until next April um, or not, I don't know. But the April events I've been to, um, it's, I'll take the first one. I was there with Dave Dellinger and it was the, uh, who many of you, whose name many of you would know from the big coalitions. Um, and the media, U.S. media was all there, um, and it, I remember them talking about how, uh, this just proved it was all a northern takeover, um, because the names that they recognized were northern, but they never bothered to read the Vietnamese newspapers. If they'd done that, they would have seen that military and political leaders from the National Liberation Front and the Provisional Revolutionary Government were very prominently identified in the ceremonies and in the newspapers about those ceremonies. And I, I talk about that because uh, Vietnam was many different things. And so the end of the war was many different things. Um, as much as in American history, the end of the American Revolution had a whole set of people who had been loyal to the British, who became boat people and refugees and went to Canada and the Caribbean and back to England. Um, there were a group of South Vietnamese who had been very thoroughly identified with the U.S. war effort and who saw the end of the war as a defeat and uh, Saigon as being occupied um, by, if not Northerners, although there, there were a lot of Northerners, but they were Northerners who had been Southerners. I mean, a lot of the people who, might, who went North after the Paris Agreement, or the Geneva Agreement, rather, had been very involved in the government in Hanoi and had been some of the people pushing hardest for Hanoi to support the struggle in the South. And so, of course, they came back and whether they were Northerners or Southerners, it depended on 
how much accents had changed and uh, what the attitude was. Again, many of the Southerners were people who had been Northerners, who were the Catholics who migrated South um, as part of the big effort by the CIA to move people South. So that the situation in 75 was for many people, liberation, and for other people, it was occupation. And you, you still, even at the five-year anniversary, you felt some of that difference, um, not what the people would publicly say, but privately what they'd say, that there still were people five years in who were not very happy about who was running things and felt discriminated against and that their kids weren't given the same opportunities as the kids of people who were revolutionaries, but, or had been patriotic from the viewpoint of the victors. And sort of each five years that process evolved um, uh, as the war moved further behind. Now the first 15 years in, Southern Vietnam and Northern Vietnam were very, very hard economically. And I remember it was only uh, when the Vietnamese uh, created Doi Moi, when they uh, opened up their economy and really uh, recognized that, that, uh, that the talents, the skills of the South, uh, industrial capital in the South was was so important to the future of the whole country um, that life became different. And also uh, the U.S. had an embargo making things more difficult, never as, as harsh as the Cuba embargo, but it was a factor. So, you know, the, the life of people in s Vietnam in the first 10 years after the end of the war um, was not easy uh, and uh, was made worse by the fact that they were all of a sudden in another war with because of the attacks from the Khmer Rouge and Cambodia and they the number of Vietnamese who died during their war in Cambodia and to, then the Vietnamese were killed when the Chinese invaded northern Vietnam I mean, those are all things that that uh, affected people's attitudes in those anniversary celebrations um, for, a, I would say, for at least the first 20 years after the end of the war. Um, beyond, and Lance, you've been, and uh, has been back many times, and there are other people who probably have even deeper roots in, in terms of the Southern reality, but there, I would say by 20 years in, it's not that everybody suddenly agreed and uh, was a member of the Communist Party, but there, there was a much more of a generational change and an acceptance that this was the government and this was going to be the government and this was the society in which you would, would your kids would come and a lot of uh, Vietnamese Second generation Vietnamese came back from the United States and found jobs and spouses um, so that you have a much more uh, continuous culture now between Vietnamese in the country and Vietnamese out of the country, um, which is not to say there aren't still political differences around human rights questions and democracy questions. Those exist. Um, and. You know, it's, uh, there's no, it does no good for Vietnam to pretend they don't exist, but there, there are differences there, but on the whole, or the population as a whole, um, it is now one country with one system, with one leadership, and the, and the ceremonies, the five-year ceremonies have become more and more cultural events. Um, of course, the, the veterans march, the, there's always a big contingent of women veterans, the long-haired soldiers, and 
and uh, military veterans and contingents of new military people. Um, but there's also lots of contingents of uh, social and economic uh, forces in, in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and there, you know, it becomes that kind of patriotic event that uh, has speeches and lots of television. And the last time we were there, they managed to have uh, live feeds from Ho Chi Minh City, I think Da Nang and Hanoi. Um, and so they were, it was like the, the way we do the New Year's Eve celebrations and involving uh, different parts of the U.S. So it, it becomes a very, uh, you know, it's partially a political ceremonial event but it's very much um, a national celebration. Uh, the, as I mentioned to some people, the Vietnamese were very clever. They managed to end the war and liberate the South uh, the day before May Day, so they guaranteed themselves annually at least a two-day holiday. Um, and uh, they, so it's part of the May Day, uh, reunification day, May Day, and then if they're lucky, it comes at a weekend and they get a four-day holiday. So it's, uh, the Vietnamese are very big on celebrating and how much it's, you know, deeply felt. Uh, the One of the reasons that we make these trips and organize different groups is that uh, the official relationship is so positive and the economic relationship is so close. Um, I mean, if you have a Samsung phone, it was probably made in Vietnam. If you look at your clothing or your shoes, much of it is coming out of Vietnam where the, their largest export market at this point. Uh, if, you count, if you don't count the Chinese who make day trips or two day trips, Americans are now the largest source of foreign tourists in Vietnam. Um, the Vietnamese are, if I put it in the introduction last time, the number of Vietnamese students in the United States is astounding. It's often supported by their own family, some with scholarships, some with support from their relatives here, but they're the like eighth largest source of foreign students in the United States at this point. And virtually all of them go home. It's not the Chinese situation. Um, and as I say, there's culturally, if you go to little Saigon in, in Los Angeles, uh, they may still have people that are politically against the communists, but the music, the popular artists, uh, the rock and roll Asian style is just a to constant flow between Southern California and Vietnam. Um, the videos, the, it used to be DVDs, of course, but now it's all online uh, and, and it's performances, live performances. Um, so, and the Tet receptions, when we started out going to Tet receptions in New York, it was 95% Americans, including sort of old friends politically and Communist Party people and all kinds of folks like that. And uh, then in the middle period, you had more and more American business people coming for the Tet reception. Now it's 95% Vietnamese, um, either, Vietnamese Americans or Vietnamese who are studying in the New York area. Um, so, and of course, the, all of the Vietnamese UN mission people and embassy people uh, bring their kids and go to schools in American schools and stay to go to American colleges. So there's, there is uh, a continuity that, um, Certainly, when we were in the midst of the anti-war movement, it never would have occurred to us that, that 50 years in the future that that kind of 
relationship would exist. So I hope that answered the question that was given and, and uh, thank you. Yeah. Joel, just, Joel is one of the people who was supposed to be on the trip <laughs> last April, so. Thank you, John, this is Mark. Yeah. That, that was a very thorough and um, complex answer to, <laughs> I thought a simple question, but it was really informative. Thank you for going you. into well, it's, that. I mean, it, history is complex and, and the people are complex. And the, um, I, it's just wonderful. Happily, the American media now allows people to use their own linguistics, their own ethnic names. And seeing the Vietnamese showing up and the Chinese showing up, that young Chinese reporter, I don't know how young she is, but the Trump goes after incessantly uh it's just you know it's our country is a different place and i think we help to contribute to that and uh, if i can be partisan we have six more months to save it for, <laughs> to get it back to where it was heading so okay so we'll see let us know if you want to do this again let me know about the breakout or if anybody wants to say anything now about the breakout rooms or where do you think this should go? Uh, feel free to say it right now. You don't have to. Hey John. Yes, go ahead, John. Um, so you know, the only thing I wanted to say was that you know you still hear from some of the folks on the on the left, uh, some of the more sectarian folks, criticism of Vietnam's current policies related to the Doi Moi development strategy that they've developed. And, and, you know, my only response is that, you know, what we fought for was not any particular policy that they should have, but for their right to self-determination. And, uh, you know, notwithstanding, you know, the control that the World Bank and the other International Monetary Fund has on all developing countries, they have a right to self-determination now. And, and, you know, we can't have hoped for anything better than that, I think, from our yeah. perspective. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I think the, I, I, I mean, I am just fascinated at this, these numbers coming out of Vietnam from the COVID stuff of any country in the world. You'd think that they would have gotten major infections from the number of Chinese tourists that were coming to Vietnam. And, you know, and it's, we have Vietnamese friends who, had been abroad and when they went home, they went, had to go into this 14 day uh, quarantine business. And, you know, it, they didn't have any choice in that, it, but they managed to keep everything. Uh, yeah, John, you're absolutely right. I was there, as you recall, for two weeks in the middle of January in Hoi An and Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi. And it was just packed with Chinese busloads, busloads. And then, boom, it stopped overnight. It's astounding. Yeah. They did such a great job. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, there was a certain amount of other motivation for that. The oh, yeah. Oh, Vietnamese yeah. were very unhappy about the number of Chinese coming. Oh, no, I get it. I, 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 <laughs> you told me that, and I understood it when I was there. Yeah. yeah. And... As I mentioned last time, I mean, the whole South China Sea, they uh, the Chinese have used the COVID era to further expand their military presence in the South China Sea. They've told the Vietnamese they can't fish anywhere in the South China Sea for six, three more months or something. It's like they've asserted an authority over it that they've never had before. So. But that's a whole other <laughs> story. Anybody else before we wrap it up on the Bev, you've been very quiet, and Bev is one of the service committee people with a history in Vietnam. And um, do you have anything you want to add to this conversation? Well, I'm just grateful for the conversation. And I the man I married, young man I married took him five years to get a CO status. Chuck was committed to doing something 
in Vietnam with Vietnamese civilians. And so we applied to AFSC and they sent us over. And in Saigon, you're in a three quarter size bed under mosquito netting with an open window to the alley where they're either castrated hogs or butchered chickens or did their dishes. I looked at Chuck and I said, I couldn't have waited until you got home. <laughs> but actually, I don't, I really, we, we have veteran friends from the Vietnam era and their returning home was very difficult. And when I realized what Chuck and I went through for the next two years in Quang Nai, a province that never, well, they didn't like the Americans, they didn't like the French either. But anyway, <laughs> um, I don't know how he would have explained that to me. Mm -hmm. So in the long run, I was very grateful for the, the chance to be there. And it was very um, difficult to learn U.S. policies internationally and especially in Vietnam. We were there shortly after My Lai. Lieutenant Kelly was on trial and the Vietnamese that would visit in the Saigon house would say, this happens every day. <laughs> He's just yeah. a scapegoat. Yeah. And Don Luce was somebody we knew, and he's the one that exposed the tiger cages on Kanchan Island because some Vietnamese told him what was really there when a Senate delegation came from the United States, and he was the tour guide. So those was a, that was an interesting time. And um, Well, I hope you and Chuck are writing about it. And... We, we have every letter that we sent home. Those were the days of aerograms. And yeah. we had a we had aerograms with carbon in our typewriter manual, and we typed every day. And one letter, when it was full, went to my folks, and the other letter went to his mom. His dad died when we were in Vietnam. And my our parents saved those letters, so we have two notebooks with the letters in little sleeves. And each of our boys has that history given to them, and. Um, People think that I and probably each of you, we should all write a book, right? Don't people tell you that? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind, not sure. I'm some not kind sure. of memoir. I mean, a copy of those letters ought to yeah. get to Swarthmore to the Peace Collection. Okay. If it's not there already because they're. No, they aren't. They've yeah. never even been, I've never even asked AFSC if they would want them. But, you know, I think that's a valid question for me yeah. to ask John. Yeah, you know, AFSC has its archives that. And Swarthmore, or Swarthmore. So they could go yeah, yeah. through that way, or they could go just yeah. directly. The, well, I there. had never heard of AFSC. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an important catch, though, which could be publicized. Which is, if people can, you know, if they're not going to self-publish anything, Swarthmore is a good repository for these notes. I didn't. You just taught me that, um, and. So I think that's a good thing to publicize. Yeah, there's Swarthmore, there's a collection at NYU Library, there's Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, I think has stuff. There are lots of, and this University of Washington map collection. They don't just have the map about the, the strike, there's, several, there's a big map of SDS activities mm -hmm. around the country. Well, it's, Wow. It's uh D I S S D S, huh? Great. Well I I was working on the Lori Stead in New York, sixty six to sixty nine, and the the black teenagers that I knew, they were going off to war, coming back in black body bag in body right. bags. Right. And some of them joined me and we were in the New York March Against the War and heard Martin Luther King and Peter Paul and Mary sang. And <laughs> yeah. It was an amazing time, but it was all new to me. Yeah, let me just end with, if you are a Peter fan, um, we sent the link with this notice of this, but I realized it was going out an hour ahead of time. But again, on our blog, there's he does these things every other day. And they're a little funky in some ways, but very informal but it's like a, I don't know whether he is reminding himself of, he sometimes forgets in the middle of the songs, but 
it's like a whole catalog of <laughs> American folk music in the last 50 years that's wow. showing up on these evening performances. And he's got 50 or 60 people that's, uh, that are listening in and writing notes. It's a um, uh, YouTube service that is there and, and he's happy Great. to add people. Um, the other thing is in terms of, of videos, the, we, again, on our li resource list, there's something called the Whistleblower Me Lai, which is absolutely phenomenal. It's done around the opera that was written about Me Lai and the American pilot who flew down and rescued people. And it's, um, it's now available for five bucks to, for a temporary download. Um, and I guess the very last thing I'll say is we've urged people several times to see either the Martin Luther King holiday or the anniversary of his death as times to pull people together and do readings of the, the sermon at Riverside Church. Uh, and it's, it is a tremendously powerful uh, uh, visionary approach to what American society could be. Um, and as, you know, one of, I was talking about Vietnamese Americans, the book, the guy in California who wrote the book about, uh, that I'm now blanking both of them. The, Go ahead. The sympathizer. Uh, the sympathizer, but his second book, the oh. the book that's more nonfiction. Yeah. Um, Refugees. Nguyen. Nguyen. Yes, is Nguyen. Nguyen. Um, yeah. But it's the book. It's his book about uh, the post-war looking at at responsibility. And any rate, he he wrote a very strong essay about how the King's speech was the most powerful thing that he's ever read. So it's finding ways to, whether it's getting people to do readings or uh, King's, there's actually an audio tape that's available to listen to. Uh, and unfortunately there's not, there's only a very short video from it, but it's, uh, it's worth, lifting up to get beyond the kind of plastic Martin Luther King that shows up for the holiday. So any rate, um, we should, we've now gone over two hours. So thank you very much for staying the 15 of us that are still here. Um, and uh, maybe we'll see you again in a month. We'll see what the reaction is to this. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank thank you, you very much. Thank you, John. Very nice. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.